Well, welcome to part one of our new series called Invested. I want to welcome all of you joining us via video at all of our campuses, also at Church Online or if you're watching on TV. We're glad that you're joining us for the start of this new series as well. Now, many people these days are looking for a good investment, aren't they? A good place to put their money where they'll get a good return on their investment. So many people buy houses, recognizing it's, a, it's historically been a great investment. You hope that when you sell it, you not only get out of it what you put into it, but even more because it appreciates oftentimes over time. Some people invest in the stock market for retirement, retirement funds and 401ks. And if you follow Dave Ramsey, uh, he recommends that after you're out of debt besides your house and you have three to six months expenses and savings, that you put 15% of your income into the stock market, saving up for retirement. So some of you are doing that. Some of you aren't doing that because you don't even like Dave and you have no idea where he came up with that number. Okay, so you're not doing it. But some are in the stock market. Some people invest in gold, right? In gold. Because they're thinking if everything else crashes, hopefully they'll still take gold at Taco Villa. And so they've got some of that under their bed. All right, just in case, just in case. But in any investment you, you get involved with, the hope is that you get a good return on your investment, often called ROI, right? A good ROI, a good return on your investment. But did you know, Paul talks about an investment in 2 Corinthians 9 that has a better ROI, return on investment, than any of the ones I just mentioned. It has a better one by a long shot. And here's what's crazy. Most people don't know about this. So I wanna spend two weeks talking to you about it, but here's what you gotta do for me. You can't tell anybody, okay? It's a secret, all right? We gotta keep it between us. Because if you share this with somebody, everybody's going to want in, okay? So 2 Corinthians 9, he talks about a great investment many of us haven't even considered, but it has a huge return on investment. And he calls this investment that he talks about in 2 Corinthians 9, he calls it generosity. <laughs> Some of you are like, see, dude, you're fooling me. That's not an investment, Chris. I know enough to know that. That's giving money away, okay? You don't get a return on that. It doesn't come back to you eventually, okay? Generosity, that's like, that's not an investment like stocks or a house or something. That's generosity. That means you, you're giving stuff away. You don't get it back. That's not, that's not an investment. Only reason you would think that is because you haven't read the words of Jesus. Can I show you something Jesus says maybe you've never heard before? It's profound. Take a look. Matthew 19, verse 29. To his followers, Jesus said this. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property, like money, given up stuff, money, sent it to the poor, helping their church, anybody who's been generous, for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. <laughs> you seen this before? Jesus says, through generosity, as an investment, what you get back is a hundred times what you invested. Financial nerds in the room, hundred times your investment. What percent return is that on your investment? hundred times. That's 10,000. That's a 10,000 percent return on your investment. He's not just talking about in this life, okay? You give money here, you get 10,000% you know, 10, return in this life. He's talking about an eternity in heaven. He's talking about something he talked about in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus told people, you should store up treasure in heaven. And he said you do it through generosity. By being generous, you can store up treasure for yourself. Jesus talks about this in heaven. 1 Timothy 6, Paul says the same thing. You can store up treasure in heaven as a good foundation for the future. So we're talking about this idea of storing up for yourself treasure in heaven through generosity. And a lot of people think about storing up treasure for themselves for retirement. We get that, right? Got to put money aside, retirement funds, invest in a 401k. We're thinking about saving up for retirement, storing up treasure in retirement. What a lot of people aren't thinking about is storing up treasure for after retirement, like when you die. Okay, not a lot of people thinking about that, but when I die, I didn't even know I could store up treasure for when I die. Like I'm storing up treasure for the future in this life. Are you saying you could like store up treasure like in heaven for the next life? That's not what I would think or what I'm saying. That's what Jesus said. That's what Paul said, which makes it a tremendous investment. Jesus says it has a 10,000% return. I dare you to try to find another investment. 
with those kinds of guaranteed returns. You will be looking for the rest of your life. This is a great investment. So here's what I want you to do for me. For two weeks, would you just let Paul make the case? If you think it's nuts and he has no idea what he's talking about, okay, then you could just ignore him and say, hey, Paul, he bought annoying it. But if you like the case he makes for generosity, then you can invest and you can get in the game and it'll be exciting. So no pressure. There's no pressure here at Experience Life. And the way you know that is we don't pass gold things around that have velvet on the inside that you got to put stuff in. Okay, so no pressure. Just asking you to consider it. Second Corinthians 9, if you got a Bible, let's go. 2 Corinthians 9, if you don't have one, we have some we'd give you for free. It's an easy to understand translation of the New Testament. You can grab one on your way out if you'd like. Table of contents in there, you can find 2 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> Let me throw it up on uh, the screen for those of you that may not have one. I'll read it up here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 10. Now, Paul, just so you know, he's writing to the Corinthians. This is a church, a town called Corinth. And he's writing to them and he's encouraging them to give to some poor believers in Jerusalem. They're poor because of persecution. They're going through a difficult time. So he's trying to raise money through a bunch of churches for these believers in Jerusalem. And if my screen dies, I apologize. And I'll go over here because it is flashing. All right, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10. He starts out by saying this to the Corinthians trying to raise this money. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. Think about that. Too often, we get this backwards, don't we? When the farmer has seed to plant and bread to eat, what do we say? Well, it's because the farmer worked hard for it. He worked hard, she worked hard, so he had seed to plant and bread to eat. And there's no question that's a part of the equation. We should work hard, the Bible talks about it. But who does Paul give the credit to for what the farmer has? For God is the one who provides for the farmer. It's God. They worked hard, sure, but he says the credit belongs to God because the farmer couldn't even work hard if it wasn't for God, right? Could you work hard if your health wasn't good? Could you work hard if your heart wasn't beating? How many of you guys think if you laid on the ground dead, you could work hard? I mean, you can't work hard unless God's keeping you alive. Could you work hard if you can't breathe? No, I mean, so Paul's saying we should work hard, but the credit for everything we have belongs to God. The reason you have the money you have, the reason you have the stuff you have, it's because God has provided for you. He gets the credit. Doesn't give the farmer the credit, doesn't give us the credit. Paul gives God the credit. When I was in high school, I went to Monterey High School here in Lubbock. And I remember going home from school one day and my parents had just gotten off work and they own a payroll service uh, called uh, Fast Pay Payroll Services. And <clears throat> basically your employer might hire them to do your employer's payroll. So they don't have to worry about cutting the checks and the taxes and the deductions and, and uh, you know, filing with the IRS and all of that. My parents' uh, company will do that for them. And so they own this company. And they came home one day, and it was in the early stages of the company. They came home one day, and I could tell they were kind of upset after a long day at work. I'd just gotten home from school. And so I said, Mom, Dad, what's up? And, and uh, Dad told me that day that uh, uh, their largest client had approached them and said that they were going public, which meant that they wouldn't be able to use them anymore. And that would result in a significant financial loss for their company. And so I felt bad, obviously. I said, Dad, I'm sorry, man. Y'all going to be okay, and it's going to be good. And, and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, son, I'm not worried about it. I said, why is that, Dad? He said this, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I recognize that. He didn't make that up. You know where he got that from? That's the Old Testament. That's Job. You know, Job in the Old Testament had everything taken away from him. Everything. What Job say? God, you gave it all to me. You've taken it away. Whether I have it or don't have it, all I'm saying is you are worthy of praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That was so inspiring to me because I knew on that day, my mom and dad were trusting that everything they had came from God. 
that client had come from God. All their other clients had come from God. Yeah, they worked hard and that's part of it, but they knew it was ultimately provision from God. See, all it takes is you losing a job, getting a pay cut, having some kind of a financial struggle, losing your health, for you to recognize everything you have comes from God. He provides it for us. Paul says he gets the credit. It's all his. Generosity starts there. Let's keep going. 2 Corinthians 9, continuing here in verses 10 and 11. He said, in the same way, he will provide, who will provide? God will provide and increase your resources. Talking to the Corinthians, sometimes he's going to increase what you have. You're going to get a raise. You're going to have more than you need. And then here's what he's going to do. And then he's going to produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Now, you may read this and think, who is God to tell them what to do with their money? He's saying, hey, I'm providing for you, and then, you know, you're going to be generous. I want you to be generous with some of the money I've given you. I mean, who's, haven't they worked hard? I mean, that's why they have the money. Who's God to tell them what to do with their money? Who's God, some of you might be thinking, who's God to tell me what to do with my money? Here's what you don't understand. He doesn't think it's yours. He doesn't. And so that's why he tells you what to do with it, because he's going, it came from me. Just like I provided for the farmer, I provided for you, so I get a say in how you spend my money. And he's saying, one of the things I want you to do is be generous. That's one of the things I want you to do with the money that I give you. So in other words, we're not money owners. We're money managers. We're managing somebody else's money. The money that I have, I'm managing it for somebody. His name is God, and so I should seek his counsel and wisdom to know what to do with it because it's his, right? Because I want to be a good money manager because what do good money managers get? They get rewarded. What do bad money managers get? They get fired, okay? It's not good. If somebody's investing your money, a financial advisor or some money manager you have for retirement, if they do well for you, guess what they get? They get a reward. If they don't do well, you fire them, okay? So here's the first reason generosity is such a great investment. It's the first reason. You're doing what God wants you to do with his money. That makes it a great investment because that means you're a good money manager. And guess what good money managers get? They get rewarded. Same is true with God. You say, God rewards us when we use our money the way he wants us to? No question about it. How? A couple ways. One, with joy. Jesus says more blessed to what? To give than receive. It's better to give than receive. It's more exciting to give than just receive. Keep piling up stuff for yourself. It's pretty cool to be able to give some of it away. There's joy and generosity. The only reason you wouldn't think this is you've never done it before. You start getting generous, though, it's real exciting to be able to give money away and help meet needs. That's one reward. Second, we already talked about his treasure in heaven, a 10,000% guaranteed return on anything you give away to help the poor get the good news out and so on. Treasure in heaven, that's a great reward. And third, sometimes treasure in this life, I'd be lying if I... If I didn't tell you that people have said as they started becoming generous, God blessed them. Like they got a, a bonus that was a surprise or a check in the mail that shocked them or something. But it's as if God was saying to them, hey, you can trust me. I know that was a big step of faith in being generous, but I just wanted to let you know, you, you, can, you can trust me. Now, for most of our marriage, me and my wife, we've seen reward and generosity mainly through the first two. Joy, we love to give. Treasure in heaven, for sure. That comes when you're generous. And sometimes we've seen God reward us and with some kind of a gift or something in this life. And it happened recently. Before I tell you a story, let me go back and give you some backstory. When I was in seminary uh, in one of my classes, they required us to read a book uh, called Money, Possessions, and Eternity by Randy Alcorn. And in this book, he's talking about generosity. And somebody asked him, and he recorded the conversation. Somebody asked him one time, Hey, Randy, I want to be generous, but can I get out of debt first? I'm in debt. That's my problem. Okay, I'm strapped for cash. Let me get out of debt first, then I'll be generous. That's cool with God, right? That's cool. I just get out of debt, 
then I'll be generous. Randy responded and he put his response in the book. Look what he said. I read this and this has stuck with me ever since. He said, if we obey God and make good our financial debt to Him, generosity, He'll help us as we seek to pay off our debts to others. But I must not rob God to pay men. I must not prioritize men over God. I must not prioritize debt over generosity. I'll go generosity first, he said, and then God will help you pay off your debts to others. God first, generosity first, doing what God wants us to do with his money first. And he told this person, he'll help you then pay off your debts to others. Don't get those mixed up. Go generosity first. Watch God help you. And so that's what my wife and I have seen in our marriage. Got married, had debt, started following Dave Ramsey's plan, trying to get out of uh, debt and it's difficult at times. And, but at the same time, we're trying to increase in generosity because we don't want to put debt before generosity. So we're increasing in generosity, which makes it even harder sometimes to pay off debt because that money could be going to debt, but you're giving it away. And so we said, God, well, we need your help. And so I've told you before, he helped us to get out of all debt besides our house and uh, get some savings, start putting money uh, toward retirement. But then something pretty cool happened this year that we count as a reward from him. We were on Dave Ramsey's step six, which is trying to pay off your home early because we wanted to be completely out of debt. And I'm thinking, this could take forever, God, because we're increasing in generosity. That money could go to our house and we, I mean, we don't have it, we're giving it away. How are we supposed to get out of debt on our house that quick? So we were doubling our payment over the last couple of years, tripling our payment, just trying so hard, making sacrifices and so on, wanting to be out of debt. Well, at the beginning of this year, we got a phone call. And somebody called us and said, would you be willing to sell your house? It wasn't on the market. There wasn't a sign in the yard. Emily had talked to a few people. So there were a few people, my wife, that knew that we'd be interested if anybody ever wanted to make an offer. But somebody called, would you be willing to sell your house? She talked to me. I'm like, babe, I'd be willing to sell anything if the price is right, including our dog. And so, I mean, I was willing for sure. I'm like, what are they, what are they going to offer? Okay. And so they made us an offer and I was like, where do we sign? Okay, let's sign that. To, let's, let's put that in writing today. It was going to result in a significant profit over what we had paid for the home. So we sell the home. We make this profit. And here's, here's the reward in our minds. Between the profit and the equity that we had in the home, for the first time in our lives, this year in August, we were able to buy our first house with cash. Now, thanks. I'll clap for myself. I'm excited, okay, for myself. <laughs> Let me clap it for yourself when you get to that point. Hopefully some of you have, some of you are on the road. But here's the thing. It's the smallest house we've ever owned, okay? It's the cheapest house we have ever owned. But we're out of debt. And there's nothing keeping God from pro producing a great harvest of generosity in us. I mean, imagine life with no payments, okay? And so right now, at this point in our lives, we're more generous. We've been able to give more money away than we ever have in our lives. And we love it. It's addicting. Because Jesus wasn't joking when he said it's better to give than to receive. The only people that don't think that are greedy people who have never started giving. Because when you start giving, it's addicting. You're always looking for ways to give more money away. Why? Because it's exciting. It's exciting. And God rewards you when you're a good money manager. We couldn't have paid off our house on our own. We just tried our best. We weren't great at this. Tried our best to put generosity first. And guess what we saw God do? He helped us pay off our debts to men. Some of y'all like, I'm getting generous today. Okay, this is exciting. Okay, so it's important. Be a good money manager. You'll be rewarded. He keeps going. One more verse. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 11. He said, yes, he's just going to repeat himself. So we make sure we understand. He makes sure, he, he makes sure they understand and we understand. Yes, you'll be enriched. You'll be provided for. Sometimes you'll have an increase in every way so that you can always be generous. Another translation says, so that you can be generous on every occasion. Let me ask you a question. Do you have room in your budget right now to be able to be generous on every occasion? Because the New Testament's telling us that's how God wants us to spend some of his money, to have some room to be generous as often as he brings a need into our path that we can meet. 
Do you have a section in your budget for that? I guess most of us don't, but God wants us to. It took my wife and I a while to figure this out, but we eventually figured it out and set aside some that we could give away as needs arise. Well, recently, one of our mission, missions partners, Back to Jerusalem, that's Brother Yoon's ministry, the heavenly man, some of y'all know him. They've been ministering to refugees in Iraq that have been fleeing ISIS persecution. You've seen it on the news, right? They didn't get to take clothes with them. They just had to leave their town because ISIS was coming in. Was some Christians, Muslims, no place to stay, no shelter, no food. And so this ministry, Back to Jerusalem, was going to take them tents and sleeping bags and clothing and food and some things like that. And so they invited our church to be a part. We said, absolutely. So thanks to the generosity of many of you that give here, we sent them a check. But at the same time, my wife and I started thinking about it. And I told my wife about this, this opportunity to help these refugees. And I said, babe, this is, a, this is one of those every opportunities we have where we could write a check. Do you, you think we should do that? And my wife said, she loves to give. So of course she said, yeah, we, we definitely should do that. And so we got the chance to write out a check and send it to them to say, hey, we want to buy some tents. We want to buy some sleeping bags. I mean, what better way could we spend our money? Upgrading my iPhone? I mean, I like that. Okay, that's good. That's not bad. But this is more exciting than that. Or buying myself something new, getting myself a few more possessions. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's more exciting to think you're providing a tent for a refugee that has no place to live in Iraq. And so we got to write the check and just felt good. Joy because there's joy and generosity. You need a segment of your budget that you can just give away as often as God gives you opportunity. It's one of the ways he wants us to spend his money and it's his money. So he gets to decide how we spend it. We can choose not to listen to him, but that makes us a bad money manager and we definitely will not get rewarded. So the first reason generosity is such a great investment is you're doing what God wants you to do with his money. That makes you a good money manager. That means he'll reward you. Now, some of you are convinced. You're like, Chris, I know. I struggle with this. Me and my family, we have been greedy. We spend everything on ourselves, okay? We hardly help anybody. We don't support our church. I need to get started. Help me know what I should do. Well, if somebody came up to me and just said, I want to get started in this generosity path, this path toward being a good money manager, I always tell them this. I say, there's a figure in the Old Testament, New Testament, and early Christian history that seems like a good place to start. And the figure is 10%. It seemed like a minimum standard of giving, Old Testament, New Testament, early Christian history. So I tell them, start with 10%. And I tell them, and give that 10%, whatever church they go to, when I'm talking to somebody, give that 10% to your local church because the local church is the hope of the world. If you don't have a vision to give that local church 10%, then go find a church you have a vision to give 10% to. Because the church has the most important mission in the world, and that is to make disciples of all the nations. There's nothing more important than that. We should do other things too. We gotta to take care of the poor. Church does that too. We gotta to do a number of other things, take care of orphans and so on. But the church is called to get the gospel out into all of the world. And so I tell people it's a very important mission. Give 10% there. So that's what I tell people to do. But here's, here's what I get sometimes. Some people just say, Chris, I get it. That sounds good. Maybe later. I can't do that now. I just don't want to. I'm not ready for that level of commitment, and so on. Is there a different, is there a different on-ramp? Is there a different place where I can come on? And so in this series, the next two weeks, we're challenging many of you that just can't get there. You want to, one day, you just don't, you just don't want to make that commitment now. Challenging many of you to come on on a different on-ramp. And the challenge um, is something I'm calling the $100 a month challenge. Coming on at the same level of a lot of other things that you buy each month. So it'd be a hundred bucks is like the same for many of you as what, you know, e eating out or something. For those of you that drink coffee at Starbucks, that probably costs you a hundred a month. You get it every day. Okay. Or go, you know, entertainment or miscellaneous or a utility bill or cable or the internet. It's a hundred bucks, hundred a month. Most people, if they work full time. It's not hard to come up with a hundred a month. We've been a hundred a month on all kinds of things. So I'm challenging our church in this series. Those of you that go here, to consider giving to this church $100 a month because you believe in it and the mission maybe has changed your life. You see that it's making an impact in other people's lives and you can come on at $100 a month. Now watch what would happen if 450 new families or individuals came on at $100 a month, we'd have over half a million dollars in new giving each year. If it was $900, we'd have over a million dollars in new giving each year to help 
thousands more people experience all God has for them in this life. It's a fantastic mission. It's an important mission. And you know how many people at our church right now are 100 a month or more? You know how many people are 100 a month or more families or individuals at our church? 700 is the number. We're very thankful for all of them. Without them, we couldn't make this happen. 700. Do you know how many people, families, or individuals go to our church? Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. All across the city and people watch across West Texas. Lots and lots of people. So this is a place where thousands of people can come on board because just most people just really aren't on board in any way. But maybe you're recognizing hearing this talk, hey, you know what? This is God's money. What have I been doing? I gotta put generosity first, not all these other things first. And what we try to do each year around this time of year is we try to give everybody in our church the opportunity to increase in generosity. Because here, here's what I can guarantee you. If I were to have a conversation with each of you individually and I were to ask you, in this upcoming year, do you wanna be more generous or less generous than you were this past year? What do you think the most popular answer would be? I ought to be more generous. There aren't many people who say, Chris, here's the thing, I was out of control in 2014. I was giving so much money away. I've got to tone it down. This is, I am nuts. I mean, no, okay, nobody would say that. Everybody would say, including myself, I want to be more generous. I'm going to be a little more generous next year. I'm going to be a little more generous the year after that. I want to be increasing in generosity. And here's what's great about increasing in generosity. You don't have to pray much about it. Because I guarantee you, if you go home today and say, dear God, would you like me to increase in generosity? I was thinking that might be a good idea. I guarantee you he wouldn't say, that's the dumbest idea in prayer I have ever heard in my life. Of course I don't. Spin it on yourself, all right? What are you thinking, weirdo? I mean, so he would, that wouldn't be what he would say. I mean, it'd be like, yeah, cool, I've been waiting for that, okay? Yeah, increase in generosity, that's a good idea. So this isn't that hard. So I wanna show you something that we made just to make this easier and give you the opportunity. If you got this card, would you pull it out real quick at all of our campuses? Flip over to the back. And we're inviting you to take one of three challenges. First challenge I already talked to you about is the $100 a month challenge. This is a place many of you can come on board. Again, if you work full time, it's a very small sacrifice. Most people can come up with this pretty easy. 100 a month challenge. The second one is <coughs> what I talked about a minute ago. The three month tithe challenge. Tithe is just a Bible word, just means 10%. But maybe you say, I'm not doing 100 a month. Forget that. I'm going Old Testament, New Testament, early Christian history. You sign me up. I'm giving a tent. I'm ready now. Sign me up. Well, you can do the three-month tithe challenge. And here's what's cool about that. Basically, that just means try it for 90 days. If you don't like it, we'll give you all your money back. Like, are you serious? I'm serious. You, you select that box. We'll sign you up for that challenge. Try it for three months. If you don't like it, if you don't sense God blesses you, if like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life, that's what you think, we'll give you all your money back. A lot of people have taken this over the years. 99% of people have not asked for their money back. Some have, and guess what? We gave it all back to them. So this is a way that you can respond. Third, you're already at 10%, and you want to take the increase challenge. This is what my wife and I will be checking on our cards. This is you're above 10%, and you want to go another percent up, maybe 12 to 13, maybe uh, 13 to 15. You want to go 2% up, or maybe you want to go half a percent, or another 20 bucks a month, or something. But you just want to increase. You want to be increasing in generosity. You're already well over the 10%. You can check that box. Or what people have done in some of our other services, you can put your own box on there, okay, and make something up. All right. Some people are marking out 100 and putting 250, or marking out what. So you, you know. But this is a way that we can respond. And here's how to make this so easy. For those of you that want to be a part, again, no pressure. But for those of you that want to be a part, you should go to our website, experiencelifenow.com. Click on Give. And when you do, you can give online by credit card, or debit card, or check. And you can, here's, the, here's what's cool. You can set it up to be recurring. That's a way you can say to God, generosity's first. I'm letting them take it out automatically first of the month or 15th of the month, or whatever day, or every couple weeks. This is coming first, I'm setting it up to be recurring. And we would encourage you, you can do it by card if you want. We encourage you to do the e-check option, because with the credit card, or the debit card, we have to pay some fees. You get that, any business does. So not all the money makes it here. But with e-check, almost all of it does, and so you put in your routing number, your bank account number, you can set it up to be recurring, it's the cheapest way for us, for you. Uh, to give. And so you can do it online. And at the back, in these orange tents in our lobby, we've got people set up with laptops that would love to help you. 
if you have questions or you don't get how to do this, you're like, yeah, I'm in, but I need help. They'll be in the back after the service and would love uh, to help you through this process. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray. And then I want to give us the opportunity to talk among ourselves, you to your spouse or people around you as you're considering this. And uh, we'll fill this out together, those of us that want to be a part. Then I'll show you a video that I think will inspire you. And uh, then we'll collect these and, and be done. So let me pray and then we'll respond. God, thank you so much that you have provided for us. God, I think me and my friends at all of our campuses today would acknowledge what we have comes from you. Just like my parents understood that. God, help us all to understand. We, we wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for you uh, keeping us alive and enabling us to work hard. It all comes from you, God, and we give you the credit. And God, one of the things you said you want us to do with your money is, because we're just money managers, is to be generous. And God, for the most part, in our society, most people aren't. They're generous to themselves, but they're not really generous to other people or to their church or to the mission of Jesus in the world. And God, I just pray that would change and that that would not be the case at our church, but that at our church, we'd wanna be good money managers because we'd wanna be rewarded because we wanna manage God's money the way he wants us to. So God, give, give us all wisdom in how we should respond. And we just thank you for the opportunity to give back because everything has come from you. We love you and it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up with uh, tithing. I never really knew anything about it. Like I knew what it was, but I didn't understand why you did it, how you did it, what it was for. Uh, the concept was really foreign to me. I feel like there was just one week, uh, school was starting up again, I was a student at Tech. I just feel like everywhere I turned, it was just tithing, tithing, tithing. I'd open up my Bible, I'd open up a book, I'd, I'd do anything online, and I just feel like tithing just kept popping in my face and I couldn't get rid of it. At this point, tithing terrified me. Um, I didn't have any money. Uh, I had an internship that was, that was a long way away and it was in a city that was really expensive to live in and it was unpaid. And I just, I knew that I was about to go broken into debt and I had no idea what, was, what I was gonna do. And so the idea of giving away money now that I wasn't gonna even have tomorrow was just ridiculous to me. I was being a very selfish person. I started tithing in August and I didn't wanna start tithing in August because that was the one month out of the year that I got in all the money that, that lasted me for the rest of the year. And it even fed through all the way into my spring semester. And all that money I got in August and so I did not wanna tithe that amount. If I was gonna start tithing, I wanted to start tithing in September when I made almost no money. I did end up tithing uh, for the month of August and it was just uh, a completely incredible experience because I was so stressed about it, I was so nervous about it and I didn't trust God with my money. And I just kept thinking like, this is all the money I get. If I take 10% of it, I'm gonna be in trouble. And uh, one night I just finally was convicted and I wrote down, I said, you're tithing tomorrow. You'll go, I was gonna go in my bank account and find out how much money I made that month and add it all up. And uh, it was really cool because I actually woke up the next morning and tech, I got a notification from tech saying I've got another scholarship. And it was just incredible seeing like immediately that change, like I can trust you God. I can trust you, you're in control. And it was just amazing. Since I started tithing, I've discovered that God will always provide. There will always be a way, and He is always going to find a way to, to provide for you. It's just been incredible watching my faith grow, because money was something I was always super nervous about. It was always something I held really tight, even since high school. I saved and scrimped every dollar that I got, and it finally just completely changed the way I looked at my money. It's where it was no longer my money that I had to work for, but it was money that God provided. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.